And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Beth Lynch, who during her near-death experience, Jesus told her to do something, and today we're going to learn about it. Beth, thank you so much for being my guest today, and welcome. Thank you for having me. Very welcome. Very grateful to be here. Thank you. All right, Beth, if you don't mind, can we start on the day that it happened and go from there? Sure. Well, what had happened was I was not feeling well, and I had, I guess I thought I had the flu because it was like every bone in my body was aching. I had a very high fever. Um, I had gone into the doctor's office the next day because it was, uh, I was starting to just feel so bad. And they, I believe they said I had a UTI. I was a little surprised. I don't think I had had one of those in 30 years. And I said, okay. So they gave me medicine, but I proceeded to get worse. My fever got higher, my aches, everything was just um, almost to the point of a little disoriented at times, laying in bed, just really thinking I had a flu. So after about the third day, when it just worse and higher fever, um, I went to the ER and I looked, uh, the doctor looked at me and my girlfriends took me because my son was little. So my girlfriends took me, went with me so my husband could stay with my son. And, um, (laughs) <laughs> the doctor looked at me and goes, we are admitting her. So, um, and I went and I spent the next, I think four days, um, I think it was home three home and then four or five days in the hospital. But by the last day, um, they were doing all kinds of tests and they were not finding anything. The fever was spiking and going down. Um, they were giving me medication, which I wasn't a fan of, but they needed to hydrate me you know, and, and I just really felt disoriented. And I, you know, I teach meditation and practice meditation. And so I would try to meditate just to help my immune system, because I knew it boosts it. And I was laying in the hospital bed, just trying to put my thoughts together to breathe and everything just hurt. And so this was just going on as they were doing tests and tests. And then I remember how I couldn't bring myself to meditate was very humbling because I know I've worked with a lot of people that will say, I can't, I can't. So I I really learned a lot in that experience as far as that part too. But what had happened, I, the doctor came in and told me that they were going to release me. And I looked at her and I said, if you let me go home, I'm going to die. And I knew it. And I said, everything hurts. I'm no better. I'm worse than I was when I came in. And she says, well, we've done every test. We can't find anything. I guess you just have the flu. And um, and now, mind you, this was probably 12 years ago now. Um, And so I said, if you'd send me home, I'll die. And I knew it. I just knew I would die. Now, I think she thought I was being a little dramatic. But um, so then I decided you know, laying there in that bed, just feeling like I was dying, that I would make a, um, a phone call to my primary doctor who was not a hospital doctor. And he, and I said, I said what was happening and the nurse must have relayed it to him. Little did I know um, he was on his way, but I did not know that. Now, so I'm laying in bed and I know that this doctor said she's gonna release me. And then all of a sudden, Um, And as a medium, I, you know, I feel spirit and I communicate for people all the time. It's what I do. But I started to see people screaming and all I, the only way to explain it is like this gray, ashy kind of view and faces and screaming. And I'm laying there and I go, oh God, please, Jesus, why are they coming to me now? I can't work i can't it wasn't the type of thing i usually see either but i knew it was a very low frequency i would say dimension of some sort and i knew there it wasn't it was not peaceful by any means because i could just hear voices screaming and i and then you know i'm i'm just observing this and my head's down and i hear that's when i saw when i said how why are they coming to me now i can't do anything And I saw Jesus in between me and them. And he was standing there. And it makes me emotional to even say this. He said, they are not coming to you. You are reaching their frequency. Pray now. And I just took a breath and I started doing the Our Father, which as a child, seeing things that scared me and not understanding the overwhelming emotions I had, I would always do that prayer. Kind of, I always kind of left it on earth as it is in heaven. It was my place. And immediately, 
when I did that, I realized that I could see that they weren't looking at me. And so that moment made so much sense with when Jesus said, pray, you know, and for him to tell you to pray, I don't know, it just something clicked because I did. And within a moment or two, I think, um, a prayer, maybe the Our Father once or twice, the doc, I hear a voice say my name and I look and it's the doctor that I had called the office. And he said, my God, what is going on here? Because he looked at me and I said, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to die. And he ran a certain test. I think he did a CT. What they had found out was my appendix had burst and it probably burst the first day. And I was going septus or septic. I don't know exactly how they say the word. And when they did the CT, they could see the poison holding in my belly, but it was starting to go through me. So they did, they brought me in uh, to surgery and do whatever they do and uh, got me the right stuff to clean up the poison, whatever they do. But, but, you know, I'll never forget. And I still, like I said, I think it was like 12 years ago, but I can, when I just re say the story, how close to death I was and why did I have to see that dimension? Um, you know, as a medium and what I've learned about frequency and energy, what I've learned so much is it started to make more sense that I was hitting a very low frequency and there are different levels, just like on earth, there's different levels of frequency in people's, you know, perception of life. And so um, something that kind of proceeded after that experience um, that was quite interesting. I remember um, obviously I started to get well rather quickly. It took a few weeks to bounce back hundred percent, but, um, but I remember, um, in my thoughts, just putting out, um, to, I feel Jesus. Cause I feel he listens. And I said, what, where was that place? And I think I knew where it was, you know, it was a very low frequency. There's a word we have for that. And, um, and I knew it was not, um, it wasn't comfortable to even see it or feel the energy that I felt, but I asked about it in my meditative moments and uh, quiet time that I take. And it was interesting that when I meditated the next day, which is usually something that I experience a lot, if I put out a thought or a question, usually within 24 hours, when I'm not thinking about it, maybe doing my daily meditation, maybe just walking in nature or doing something, I get an answer. And it's clear to me that that answer is about what I thought the other day, you know, and usually 24 hours it used to be 72. Now it's much quicker. I think it's part of the trust. Um, and I remember the experience that I was seeing was I was sitting like at the, in the grand Canyon and I was sitting and I've never been there, but let me tell you, I felt like I was there and next to me, I could feel the presence of Jesus again. And I had asked about that place that I seen when I was, um, filled with poison and he told me to watch just watch because I could see the gray and I got that glimpse again of what I had seen that day in the hospital and I could see it and he said just watch and then it, it was almost like when you're if you're from the generation of I know I am where we were at concerts and you hit your big lighter and it was like ding 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 you know now it's cell phones so it's a little different when you see those things and um, as I saw those little sparks of light, it was like so vast. I mean, I couldn't even, it looked like, like I said, sitting on the highest part of the Grand Canyon and seeing it real low. And when I saw that, I said, what is that? He says, that is them reaching and asking for light. That is them forgiving themselves and allowing themselves to go to the light. And that, you know, now I'm like in this experience with tears coming down my face. And even though that wasn't probably the an NDE, it was an experience I had about seeing that frequency and how quickly, and, and, and I was told by him that when that light sparks, immediately there will be an angel, there will be a loved one, there will be myself there to take them to the light. So it was a very powerful thing to see how that kind of people who, you know, in a sense, bring themselves into that frequency when they cross over and how in an eerie way, beautiful it was to see how fast they could leave that darkness. And such a parallel to where we are in the world. 
you know, when someone says, I, I just said, I'm done, I want to make this change, or I want to do that, and they, and they immediately, you know, share their epiphany of how everything started changing immediately. And I thought that was just, an, it's a beautiful way to understand how we can shift our own place and direction if we really go to the light of the heart. And he said that was their heart light, illuminating. So that's where my experience in then having that, you know, the question that I had about it and how it got answered to me was so beautiful and brings hope to people, you know, on earth as they're living. Well, thank you for sharing your experience, Beth. If you don't mind, can we first start with what did Jesus look like? Very traditionally the hair a length of hair the robe um he really did i was raised catholic it was my foundation as a little girl um it i had a lot of fears about things um like when they talked about purgatory i can remember sitting in class and feeling well what happens my parents got to wait in this place for me to get there and you know maybe or will i have to be there first and it, so there were things that scared me um but you know, when I look at the experience of Jesus and I see how natural I've always felt with that communication and I see his message is about healing, about love, self-love, about compassion, about forgiveness and the power in that. And, you know, as a channel, when I'm working with people and I see how many people will struggle with self-love or they can't forgive, you know, and I just sometimes am in awe about the simplicity, but also the natural feeling that he gave me to communicate. And when you trust it, whether it's Jesus, is it, is it an angel? Is it, a, you know, it, I don't know. There's no wrong. I know he's not for everybody, but I know how I've always felt comfortable. And he really did seem to be that traditional kind of view that I've always known. Why do you think that when you crossed over to the other side, that you crossed over at such a low frequency? Well, and that's because of the poison, the poison. And I know there was a lot of drugs in my body. I know they put me in Denalin, Denalin. And I remember my husband going, oh, this girl, does. I mean, I can feel aspirin in my body, you know, I mean, <laughs> You put that, don't give my wife much of that because <laughs> he was there when they were going to administer it because the achiness in my body was just, it was almost like just to lay there hurt, everything hurt. And so because I said that, they wanted to give me things. And that drop in frequency alone with the poison, not to mention some kind of strong meds like that, you drop in frequency. And what happens when we, our frequency gets too low is the spirit does start to leave. I mean, we really do call that death you know, but you don't have to die in low frequency either. You know, that can be mindset. It can be, um, there's a little, there's a few other things. Um, some medications can drop your frequency and create an out of body experience. I've experienced it myself and I've experienced it for others in their, in my channeling. So that's why I did more the poison. I would say the poison and, and probably the medication mix was not, you know, was the combo that dropped my frequency so low that I observed that dimension and that place. Do you feel like that experience is just as real as you and I talking right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the emotion of it, you know, is real. Like I can, it's not like it's scary because I'm, I'm more of an observer of it now, but when I was in it, I mean, it just felt like it, when I think about how I felt then, and I go to that emotion, I, it's like, it was forever, but it was eight days. That's a long time, you know, to be declining slowly, but surely basically, and not really being able to know why I remember home when I first started to feel sick. I remember I felt a sharp pain down in the lower abdomen, but it was so quick and it went away. And what was happening was they told me, the doctor told me that when they were doing the ultrasounds and stuff, excuse me, what they were seeing was my appendix looked fine. But there was this, I, they did some kind of CT when that other doctor came and then they seen it had already ruptured and they could see the, the poison sac, I guess, that was already building up in me. 
in the belly area. I guess that's, I remember it like said like that. And I remember, wow. And so that, thank God for that test you know, because they might not have noticed that the poison was already accumulating and because it had burst. So you said that you were a medium and I believe that you were already a medium before this happened. Mm -hmm. Did you get any new abilities after this experience? I don't think there was anything new. Um, I felt, um, remember, I think that the one thing that stood out to me is like when you can't, bring your thoughts together to meditate. I think I, I gathered a little more patience or compassion when people say they can't and began to realize that the breathing is really a very important part of when we meditate because it does send a signal into the nervous system when we slow our breath. And it's very strong, it, you know, within four to eight breaths, you can already start to change the frequency, uh, the nervous system, which will start changing your frequency, which can help with any kind of mental, emotional issues, anxiety, everything. We have to go to the breath. So I did feel that I had a little more because I couldn't put the words together. You know what I mean? To say, OK, breathe slow and go to the inner light of my heart, which is something, you know, my work is called inner light teachings because I've always felt connected to the light of the heart and never really understood hundred percent why I just knew that's where I always began my own blessings and my own meditation. And for when I sit with others and I remember it wasn't even that uh, maybe a few years ago where I was gazing at a picture of Jesus that was on the, on a wall and I noticed the sacred heart with the flame. And I went, duh, <laughs> I never noticed that. I've seen that picture millions of times, my upbringing, you know, school, whatever. And, yeah, mass cards. I never clicked the inner light of the heart, you know. So then when he showed me the vision of, you know, the very darkness of low frequency we can go to, then it was interesting to see those little lights like, you know, and how fast they were calling, you know, their heart light was illuminated to move their frequency up and get them out of that darkness. Do you think that most people who are in that low frequency are stuck there forever or they all eventually get out they definitely have the free will to get out and you have to understand the will to want to get out and what we are willing in our thoughts is happening whether it's our perspective of life a perspective of our relationship or a perspective of even our financial situations everything is the energy in the thought process we're putting into it and we're willing that to happen. And, you know, like I share in the law of attraction, it's working no matter what your perspective is or what you are willing to happen. So sometimes we have to step back and understand the power of the will of who we are as a, a higher being, a spiritual being, you know, uh, in this human body. And, the principles, the spiritual principles are so simple, whether you want to call it spiritual or higher principles or a higher intelligence, it's really all the same. It's sacred, it's powerful, and it's natural. And when we go against our natural alignment to who we are as a higher being, we sink. You know, we sink. We, we drop frequency. We know everything comes down into that lower perspective of things. And... The law of attraction's working no matter what way we're thinking. So, you know, sometimes I, I, I the law of attraction is just such a, a, you always hear it, you hear it, you hear it. But I think if you really step back and breathe into what the law is, it's sacred, it's powerful, and it's working. And it's, we are the intelligence behind our, behind the law, the human species, you know, and how we use and we fuel you know, the, ener the energy we put in, the fuel that we're putting in is allowing it to draw things to us, push things away or hold things still, you know? So if we, if we go that will to want to be open to the higher understanding of who you are right there would shift you out of something. I've seen it. I've seen it happen with people. Has the memory of this experience faded at all over the years? Not at all. When I, even bringing it forward here, like it, my eyes are getting a little teary and I can feel the emotion, um, but it's not like it's a reliving of it as much as it's an, an emotional 
sometimes when you experience something, no one can give you that, but no one can take it away, whether it's a beautiful experience or if it's something that was really hard, you know, or difficult to go through. And when, you know, when I reflected on it and I realized sometimes how close to, you know, when a doctor says, oh yeah, you probably, you would not have made it through the night. You're, you would have went full on and things would have started shutting down. And I, you just go, wow, you know, how close you can come is pretty powerful. And, you know, your show, people have beautiful experiences, you know, and they share them and, and some experiences are a little scary. But I think the, the main thing is we come back with an understanding that there's something so much more bigger than who we are, but we are a part of that bigness. And we shouldn't be afraid to be a part of it, and know the naturalness of our communication with spirit or angels or the God or Jesus, whoever you want to call it. How do you think you've changed due to this experience? Hmm. When I say I changed, I think it, if I was to say what I feel in, in the moment of that question, the passion to really believe in the power of the spirit and who we are and how connected we are and how we can heal, really, it's not like I needed proof by any means, but boy, the power of that. And to see those little heart lights and know that immediately they were going into light as opposed to the shadow or the darkness that they were in and who knows how long they were in there you know um there's no time in the on the other side you don't really feel time you know um there was an experience i had once in a group channeling with um people and there was a person who was responsible for their own life um and going into the other side but something that happened was there was this cave in the the spirit energy that was being called coming forward came out of the cave and made a comment that this was the first time in 19 years that he came out of the cave and then we became aware i became aware that he had you know taken his own life but what was interesting is the woman who was his spouse at the time um their daughter had just turned 19 and was starting to ask questions because she was very little when he did. I think, I think she was like a year old. And so it was interesting that he said it was the first time he came out of the cave and he wanted to help his daughter understand. So he didn't know he was in there 19 years. I'm, I don't think, you know, but it was just an interesting, I haven't thought of that and it just came forward now. I think showing the time, the timelessness that goes on you know, on the other side or in a, in a different dimension. Do you think that this experience changed anything in the way you practice mediumship? Mm, no, because I was pretty, pretty well in then. And, you know, I think the, the sacredness of it, um, that there are different dimensions. I mean, to experience it that clearly, I always, maybe I didn't realize it could go that dark. Um, but even though I experienced it, I did realize that, you know, these energies were not coming to me. I was drifting into that frequency. Um, it, I think it made me understand frequency a lot more and really understand it, like to feel that. That definitely became more, more of the reality of it. Have you ever meditated and found yourself in higher frequencies so oh, you yeah. can kind of know the difference or or experience yeah. the difference yes i've definitely had um many experiences in meditation where i was in the presence of the divine um i remember one of my first ones when i really didn't understand it which was kind of interesting so i was kind of in the beginning of really accepting the natural sensitivity i had was a strength not a overwhelming you know, scary thing. Cause it's scary it, it, when you don't understand the even feeling the divine is emotional, you know, and that emotion I have found through what I experienced is what some people are afraid to feel that purity sometimes is so tears run down your face, but it feels there's, it's hard to explain, but it's just peace. And it's probably that as close to that peace we can get if you cross and they say they feel that light that's so in, amazing you know what i mean like and filled with love so i feel i have felt experiences and i remember um i was 
in a meditation and I kept seeing these blue eyes and I, and, and I could feel my body vibrating. Like I was in the meditation, very aware, not in a deep sleepy one. There's different kinds of levels of meditation you can go into. And I'm very big on conscious meditation because being conscious during the meditation is very powerful. And you, you, it's a different feeling than if you're sleeping more and you go through one and they can both be powerful. No, don't get me wrong. But I remember seeing these eyes and just in my mind going, who are you? It was just a natural thing because they were looking at me. And then I could see this white kind of hologram uh, robed person. I didn't really say that was Jesus because that when I see Jesus, he looks more of a, in the human sense, this looked a little more in the higher, higher kind of entity. And, uh, and when I, all of a sudden I heard the voice say to me, I am not the letter as you know it, I am the sound of I. And I just, and the way my body felt vibrating, like literally, and to see that, see my, in my inner screen, this vision, and then feel the emotion <clears throat> that I was feeling, which was pure, pure peace. I was like, wow. Now, I honestly didn't really get what that I was at the time, <clears throat> but a few days later, I had gone to a thrift store with my husband to look for a baby, a dresser for the baby that was on the way. I was pretty close to nine months right then. And um, we walk into this thrift store and there's dressers galore. And I draw to this one dresser and I go over and I pull on the drawer to open it to see how easy they opened. Well, this drawer was stuck sticky. So I pulled real hard. And when I pulled real hard, a book flew out. I think it's probably in this room somewhere. This book. And when the book flew out, it was very old and like old library book, like still had a thing in it. And oh God, I wish I had the title of it. It's probably in this room. I wish I thought about it. And very, you know, crunchy kind of plastic on it and old yellowy pages. But it said the seven. And when I opened the page, the book up to read what it was about, it said the seven sounds of God. Hmm. So I'm like, whoa, you know, so I'm looking and. I, I is one of them. I this, I that, the I, all like I had experienced. So here I am. Oh my God. And I mean, this book flew out of the drawer. The guy at the counter goes, well, I've never seen that happen before. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of the book. Science, seat of the science of soul, the science of soul or something. And, um, and I said, how much for the book? And he goes, oh, you can have it, honey. <laughs> It's okay. I took the book. I didn't get the dresser, but I um, still have it. And it was the seven sounds of God. And I was one of them. And then that experience, I mean, it just made me, I got in the car and I told my husband, I said, I don't know if you think I'm crazy and I don't care, but I had this experience the other day. Look at this. I, this, it's all about the I, 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 I am, I, I, I. So that was pretty powerful for me. Hmm. I always feel it. You always get the backup. You need you know i never needed it but i always would get something like that and um that was beautiful i don't know that was a beautiful experience so i'm glad thank you for letting me share it <laughs> sure now you were raised catholic and i'm not sure if you still have catholic elements or parts of it in your life but where are you now on your spiritual journey well definitely um devoted to um, you know i've understanding the spirit and where I've come to understand it is the spirit is a few things. It is the intuitive nature that we have. And I think intuition is survival mechanisms, not just talking to spirit or channeling and, you know, it's intuition is a survival mechanism for us down there. Um, so you have in the spirit energy of who you are, you are intuitive, you are creative, you are compassionate, you communicate from a higher place, which is part of these experiences that we're sharing. You, um, the compassion, I think I said, and also the connectedness and that eternal essence of who we are is all in the spirit. So we need to understand our spiritual essence for our personality to, to really be beyond its human potential, which is, we're all here to be 
something, you know, it's not how we're doing it as much as that we are open to the power of the spirit of who we are and the spirit to live and to create from that frequency of the spirit, which is the highest frequency we can express in as a human being. So if you honor that and devote to it, don't work on it and try to connect, just be devoted to it every day through mantras, through intention, mindful moments, um, then you align yourself into that frequency. Your personality is constantly using that source to be creative, to trust its intuition, to be compassionate. I mean, think of all the things that are missing in our world. There's a disconnect. And how we're going to do it is not necessarily got to be Catholic or Buddhist or Jewish or this or that, because every religion really has higher principles in it. There's two sides to, there's duality. So if we honor it, so yes, I think the understanding of Jesus um, being kind of who I talk to in my own way as a ch young girl going to church when I would feel things that were overwhelming or why do I feel these things, Jesus? And I don't know if I really felt I got an answer at the time, but they definitely, now I understand all those questions. And I am devoted to it. And I sit quietly. And like this morning, I woke up and it was just, it was early. And I said, I just got to go to the sunrise, you know? So you get up and you go, you know, or, or you go sit in your woods or you look out your window if you can, or meditate to connect yourself to something in nature. Because nature is where we're going to feel the most divine energy, nature. It really is. And if it can't be in a physical way, go into your inner mind. And, you know, God bless you two for all this beautiful music with the nature scenes. I mean, there's so many ways. Or garden, you know, do something to devote to the power of your spirit. Because, I mean, anxiety and depression are a manifestation and an and addiction to the separation. If we're not plugged into some beautiful source of energy, we deplete. We'll deplete. Are you still connecting with Jesus or communicating with him? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I feel like I do it. Uh... Mm -hmm. I do it all the time. It's, it's so natural. I mean, to me, it's very natural. So I remember there was something I was going through. Um, I had moved. We moved about a year ago and we relocated. And I walk on this bridge and it's about a mile one way and a mile back. And it goes up pretty high. And it goes over uh, the river, a uh, river. And I remember the adjustments and making some changes. And there was something that I was uh, very, I was, I was down about and I was questioning some things. And so I was putting it out there. And as I walked over the bridge, you know, I said, I'm just going to let it go. But I was having a human moment. You got to, I have, you know, we have to have them, you know? And um, so it was a few things as I started my walk that day and I just, the sun was out and the water was like glass. And I remember just feeling very emotional that I was letting things get to me. And I said, you know, I just kind of practice what I preach and walk this walk. I'm going to release everything. And I got right to the top of the bridge and it was like a vision of Jesus right there, right there. And he was kind of like over it. And then, he went, do not fear. Like he, it was like, do not fear and walk on water with me. And I had this vision of me on that water that looked like, you know, ice. It was so flat that day, just almost floating over it. And the emotion that I felt with the, all of a sudden it just like, I felt like everything went. No, of course I wasn't going to literally do that. Right. But it was a moment of just stopping and just letting the vision take me. And I think if we just really surrender to some of the things that are troubling us and really start learning to believe we can begin in the mind with it, it's amazing. The emotions will follow. The emotions follow and then that's your frequency. So I think, yes, the answer is yes. I, that was probably a matter of a few months ago that that happened. And, and it really, every, I just think back and go, everything shifted after that because I surrendered. He can't do it for me. He can't, nobody, you know, it can't be done for us. We have to have this will, getting back to the will, to want to. And I think that sets everything in motion. The round pegs go in the round hole. And that's how I'm just getting the inner vision right now. You know, instead of trying to force things or worry about, you know, things. 
and you know, just like everyone else, I can have moments, but they're moments, you know, that's what I tell people. Oh, I worry all the time. I worry all the time. They'll say, I'll say, you know what? Worry is repetitive thought of lowest frequency possible of worst case scenario. So what do you think your law of your, where you're sitting in your frequency, your law of attraction is taking you there? It can't unthink that you're such a good person and you deserve better. It can't do that. You're the, so change your thoughts. And if you don't know how you start with something like I embrace the strength to move through these struggles or, and accept or, or be open to the higher order, something where you make the statement, make the statement. Intention is everything. All right, you have your book behind you, Life, Death, and In Between. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, you know, Life, Death, and In Between, it was kind of like, uh, it was funny how the title came about. It had another title, and that was like the subtitle. <laughs> and every time I would talk about it, I was doing some podcast things. Um, it was probably a year and a half ago. The book wasn't even done then. And they kept, every time I said Life, Death, and In Between, they said, that's the, they would say, that, I like that, that Life, Death, and In Between. Ooh, oh. So I said, maybe that needs to be the title. So that's how the title came about. But it is through, through death um, that we learn more about life. And then the in-between can really make a lot more sense in how we're going to go through the in-between of the two. So the, And it's really what I've learned about um, spirituality, the law of attraction, how it's working, our thoughts, our energy field, the, the power of this, um, experiences and channelings that, you know, there's some of those in there too. So 28 years of being a conscious you know, consciously doing channeling is, is things I've learned. And that's what's in that book. So how long have you been a medium and how did it start? Well, it's, it's been 28 years on purpose. <laughs> I call it on purpose. Um, but, you know, there was quite a few years where, you know, as a girl, little kid feeling things and sensing things and, um, not understanding it, but through through the death of both my parents is when it really became like the week before my dad passed, I had felt death around me. And I didn't understand that, but I knew I felt death. And then I told a friend, we were at, it was a Saturday night, and I said, I just think I need to go talk to a priest because that again, I my background was, you know, go, you know, I I never I hadn't gone to church in years, but I would pray and talk and have my conversations. And so back then I was not a practicing medium when these two deaths happened though. And, um, but then uh, that was a Saturday night, Monday morning, my father had a, a major heart, fatal heart attack. And my friend had asked me a couple weeks later, you know, she said, do you ever get those feelings anymore? And I go, Oh my God, no, I forgot about them. So I'd never gotten them again. Now I didn't know who was going to die. I just knew I felt death. So what I was probably feeling and what I've come to learn is the frequency of my dad was probably dropping. He had had heart issues, but we didn't know he was going to you know, go that fast. He was only in his fifties. Um, and then I've always lived like I was going to die at 32. Like there was, like, I would think I'm, I'm not living past 32. I, I had fun in my 20s, I'm just going to say. <laughs> but I had this kind of subconscious little place. I don't think I'm going to live past 32. Well, when I was 32 is when my mom was killed. And I dreamt, I was dreaming, it was September 22nd, uh, 1993. And I was dreaming um, that there was an intercom system. And I remember there was gray walls and I could see people going doo -doo 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 -doo, like this, like it, that's what it looked like. And then I heard an intercom say her name and say that she was dead. And I, in my dream, started screaming and crying. And I was, no, no, my mother, you know, is dead. She's dead. And then I woke up and I looked at the clock and it was 3.15 a.m. And I could tell, I mean, I'd been, tears were on me and I was like, wow, what kind of dream was that? You know, wow, that was Oddly went back to sleep, woke up early in the morning. I had my little nephew, so I had to get up early and get him to pre-K and got in the car, turned on the radio, and it was on the news that the Amtrak had crashed in the middle of the night and they were just getting cruised to the scene. And here's me. Oh, my God. No, my dream. My dream. No way. And I knew my mom was on the train. So proceeded to just have to do, you know, got my nephew to school. 
called my sister, driving to the drove, driving over to the Amtrak station, which happened to be right near where I was, and wanted to ask what to do because my mom was on a train, and I said, "Are there two trains?" And they gave me a phone number, and I'm like, "Oh my god, oh my god, this isn't good." So we really didn't know much at that hour. This was 7:30 in the morning, uh, and not all. You just kept hearing that the train crashed, and you didn't. They didn't even know what, who, how many survived it or anything at the moment. But I heard my mom's voice in the car. I had it on, I was driving to my sister's and I heard, Mary Beth, I'm all right, I'm happy. And, I, and it was like I plopped back in my seat. It was like I was not even driving the car for that few seconds. And I went, oh my God, she's gone. I knew it, I just knew. And then, you know, we had to go through it like everyone else does, waiting for the phone call and doing all that. And, but a year later I went to a medium and I mean, we both went, me and my sister and, you know, angry, sad, why God, why did these things happen? All the test of faith, not feeling faith, not wanting, I just was angry for a year. That's what I feel like. Um, and then the medium, I remember we went, we sat with her and she looked right at me. She's young lady, you're not using your gifts and abilities. Your mother in the spirit world is telling you, you're going to do what I do someday. And I'm going, watch, I don't think not. <laughs> Yeah, I was a little more than I needed to hear in that moment. I was a hairdresser. I'm good. Leave me out of that. Uh, but the session was very clear that our mother was in the room. And she said, she will help you, guide you to your books and teachers, but you must choose the path. And I really did not get that at all in the moment. But you know what? I left there. We felt a sense of peace. We knew our mother and dad were in that room. There was no way to some of the things that she had told us. And I remember it was a couple of weeks later, I went to a metaphysical store where they sell crystals and things like that. And I saw this little pamphlet that said tarot classes, um, private or group, um, and this lady's name, Elizabeth, she, she was an astrologer. Just And I decided to do that. I was very drawn to it, even though I didn't wasn't sure it was okay to do tarot because I didn't understand it at the time. Um, but it the first thing she said to me that day was when I when I met her, when I went to my class, with her every Tuesday at two for two years. Um, I mentored with her. She said, I bet you didn't know Carol was a spiritual tool. And I go, no, I didn't. I was a little nervous. <laughs> I'm intrigued by it. She goes, oh yes, dear. it's all how you read it. And you'll read it from the spirit. And so I started to learn about symbolism and the chakra colors and the symbolisms and metaphors and the language of the soul just started to really make sense along with what I was experiencing. And I got into meditation and, you know, I started practicing that, you know, and I think it took me two years where I didn't say anymore, I'm trying and I can't stop thinking. And now I tell people, you don't try to, you don't stop thinking when you meditate, you, you discipline your thoughts, become a disciple of them. It's different. That's how I like to teach. I like to make it very simple for people. And that was the, where it all really it was just a natural. I didn't even try to communicate with spirit, really. I had experiences where I would see them, but I never looked at it as I was channeling, except, and then all of a sudden I would do um, the cards. I would still doing hair at the time, but I would do cards on the side with, with clients and you know friends. And one day I was working with this woman and drawing her little cards to give her her intuitive spiritual guidance. And I see this little thing off the side go, and I'm like, that's a man. And I'm, talking to her but i'm and i hear tell her david's here just like that i could see him tell her david's here and i go david's here and she screamed and it was her brother in spirit and i jumped and she goes i didn't know you did that i go i didn't either <laughs> and you know i went home that night and after that work day or whatever to call it work and i said okay god i guess i do do it and i surrender but you better show me what I'm supposed to because I didn't know, you know, really I didn't. And I think that surrendering, it was just spirits never stopped after that. Everybody I read, people came in. It was just really a, and I trusted it, you know, whether it's a personality, a name, an incident, I just trusted it so much and they're easy to trust. That's what I say. And when you see the healing in someone's body changes, their, their color can change sometimes in the channeling because they're going up in frequency when they feel the spirit of their loved ones that there's no words to see that 
And that's what happened to me. I guess I didn't realize it at the time, but and I just surrendered to it. And it was, like I said, 28 years ago now. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions or chit chat with you. Are you open to that? And if so, how can they reach you? Yes, absolutely. I have a website, innerlightteaching.com, inner light. Um, and people can find me on YouTube, Beth Lynch Medium 444 and all that social media stuff. Yeah, but the website's probably the easiest way to reach me. And there's a phone number and an email address. So, and that's what I do, you know, um, work via Zoom all the time. It's what I do. Mm-hmm. Teach classes, meditation as well. Are you working on another book or anything else that we'd like am. us to know about? You are psychic, Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Intuitive. And psychic means connect to the soul. I read that in a, in a book. I said, oh, I never realized that. Um, connected to the soul level. Um, yes. The next book is going to be a little more more experiences and channelings and, and like a, a, a specific one, obviously names will be changed and all that to help. Um, and then the lesson that I feel was I experienced or learned and then how to help others see the lesson in certain kinds of communication. So it's going to be more about, you know, maybe a series of six to eight, very, I feel were profound to me to experience and how to help others. Because the communication is is natural. It really is. Your loved ones hear you. I tell people when you experience a session with me, I hope you feel that you didn't need me. And that because they want to show you, you know, they want to show you they're with you, you know, and that's important because we connect to the pi- higher spirit of them. We understand in our own spirit. And sometimes it's through a loss of a loved one that we have to awaken and feel that love. Do you think that at some point in your life when you were young or very young, you had some kind of spiritual awakening experience, even though you didn't recognize it at the time that gave you this ability of connecting with other people on the other side? I often think sometimes maybe I (laughs) did I apply for the job before I got here Um, because I can remember being very young, you know, five, six just asking God, why, why do I feel what I feel? And why do I see what I see? And I, I would look up at the sky and I would say it, you know? And I remember one time looking up very young and just saying, starlight, star bright, all the stars I see tonight, show me light. <laughs> Shooting star went flying over my head and I remember I ran into the house because it scared me because it was so there. I mean, it was like, how did they do that, you know? And, but it wasn't, you know, we can see shooting stars if we look up, right? Not all the time, but it was kind of a, one of those moments where I knew somebody was listening. And I know my friends tell me, um, my lifelong friends, and we would play kickball on the street back when you could, um, <laughs> in the little street we had out near our houses, um, that I would just stop and look up and they'd go, uh oh, there she goes again. And I remember saying, who are you? Stop watching me. (laughs) You know what I mean? Let me play. (laughs) So I've had these experiences for so long. And I think the beautiful thing is, I think a lot of people have experiences of a, of a, what we would call supernatural, but it's, it's just super cool and it's natural, you know? And I think when we take those moments and, and, we just allow them and, and just imagine if we're like really the children were taught, you know, I have a lot of people that reach out to me and say, my child is, you know, looked at my grandfather's picture and called him by his name and he's never met him. He died many years ago. My child's only three or four, you know, and the outcomes and I go, look at the children are very connected to that natural and they've met their loved ones over there that might be there is going, Oh, you're going to go down there now. I mean, this is something that happens. You know, I truly get, I feel it. So it's natural for them. So we have to sometimes understand that part of it, that it is natural and we allow it to evolve or we don't. And then there's different levels of evolution of this. Not everyone wants to be a medium, you know what I mean? Or, or do this kind of, where they're, you know, what we do, educate on the understanding of the other side, the light, spirit, and 
Um, but no matter what we're doing, we can incorporate that higher understanding and higher principles. I really believe that. And I believe that's our purpose, all of our purpose. How we want to do it is up to us. Do you turn it on and off or are spirits trying to connect with you all the time? Right now I hear the name David. <laughs> so I don't know if you knew a David in spirit or one of our listeners are going to, but um, the, I don't say it's turned off. I say it's turned down. And that's the beautiful thing about meditation because no matter where you are with how connected you are to what is the big, the larger part of who we are, the higher frequencies, um, meditation balances it. So I always feel I don't have to protect myself. I have to, you know, they, they need to honor. I think they honor it. When you turn it down, meditation balances it. That's the way I think the easiest way. So I feel that there's times when they honor that I'm not actually sitting with the person, you know, um, but there's been spontaneous moments. And when I sent something for someone, I remember once in the grocery store walking along in my little hometown and um, hearing a horse voice say, olive loaf. I've told this story before. And I went, olive loaf. And I knew it was a voice in my head. And I'm going through the deli aisle and I hear olive loaf say olive loaf. So here's me. I'm looking at all the people. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Just yell out olive loaf? I mean, I'm laughing, thinking, who is this spirit talking to me right now? And all of a sudden, I saw someone I knew, one girl, who I grew up with on that little side street. I was talking about kickball. And I said, oh, my God, her dad's in spirit. And her dad, I knew, but I you know, had talked, you know, he'd been gone many years. So I walked over to her. I said, hey. And she goes, hi. And I go, olive loaf? And she goes, What? I go, I'm just saying. And I told her and she goes, wait a minute. My dad knows I hate olive loaf. You know, he used to send me to the store to buy his olive loaf, you know, da, da, da. and here I'm standing in the deli counter and I'm looking at olive loaf thinking, and I go, well, she goes, I don't even believe in this stuff. I go, well, I'm just saying, maybe that's the reason he said it. You know, he's with you that he's with you. And we had a little laugh about it, but that was probably one of the funnier spontaneous moments, you know? I don't want to just walk up to somebody and say something, you know, if it, if it happens, it does, but it's, it's, it's rare that, that, that it's rare for me. I've had people I've worked with have lost, um, you know, young adult children, like car accidents and things. And once I've made a connection with someone, it is not uncommon for me to get something more spontaneous from someone that I recognize. You know, and then I know that I can respectfully reach out to that person. That's more of what I experience. And it, and it does happen. That does happen. You mentioned you have a YouTube channel. What kind of content do you create there? Um, my YouTube channel has some discussions on topics that I've learned about, you know, or learned how to understand the spiritual principles like of mental health, um, spiritual principles, you know, of intuition, um, anything in channeling everything's on there um there's some podcasts on there from that i did quite a ways back um called inner lately inner lately and yeah so there's things like that educate it, it educates and there's some of excuse me there's a channeling it's uh the light a show i did um quite a few years ago now in a beautiful old theater in my hometown and that shows me channeling, you know, and doing, talking to the audience. So that's kind of neat to watch too. Anything that's spiritually, the spiritual reality of living, it's all in there. And communication with the other side is part of it. All right, Beth, well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes, to believe in the power of your own spirit and to be devoted to it. That's something each day where you can just sit, slow your breathing, and believe in the power of your spirit. Beth, thank you for that message, and thank you for being my guest today. I wish you the best. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.